Tina Fey, ladies and gentlemen. It's, Tina, it's amazing how many people are wearing glasses in honor of us tonight. <laughs> it's true. Fantastic. Well. Wow, this um, makes complete sense. What'd you say? This makes complete sense. Yes. Um, first thing um, I'm going to do is something that Dave Barry, the great comedy writer, said never to do <laughs> unless you have uh, medical records from a doctor and a medical report from the hospital, and that is ask a woman if she is pregnant. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have been told by some doctors that this is a uh, hysterical pregnancy brought yes. on by <laughs> yes. a desperate need to sell books. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's going to sell a lot of I'm books. I'm going to continue with it. Yeah. And then when the tour is over, flat. Flat. Cool. And do the breasts go down? I hope not. <laughs> well, neither do we. Uh, that's all the questions I have prepared. <laughs> I've read your book and it was thrilling. I don't know, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm up to here. And uh, no, I've read the whole book. I've marked a few places I want to uh, go over. I have some questions here. But the main thing, we all know you do uh, a lot of, oh, some late arrivals. Hmm. And it's... You're only 25 minutes late. Um, very important down there at the bakery going on. Uh, um, but Tina Fey, you are you're a writer, you're a producer, you're an actress, an impressionist, a performer. You write screenplays, you write teleplays. Now you're an author. My question is this, why no banjo? <laughs> My, um, not many people know this, but my parents were brutally murdered by Earl Scruggs. <laughs> and I don't I know, re remember it because it was before I was born. Oh. <laughs> <Didn't>. <laughs> it's interesting you would leave something like that out of the book. I mean, sort of disqualifies the book as a memoir, in my view. <laughs> now, I was, I was. Well, first, let me ask you a question. When you were doing your great uh, episodes as Sarah Palin, well, <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong. We're going to kind of work backwards in your life, I think. Okay. Uh, when, when there was this moment when you were on stage and Sarah Palin was off stage. By the way, there's some very interesting things about what was going on backstage. I'd like to cover that. Okay. But Maybe I read into this. You were on stage, Sarah Palin was off stage, and you two crossed. And it was the first time that I know of that you uh, had met in all this uh, era of impression that you were doing on her. I sensed a little bit of friction. <laughs> was I wrong? Uh, no, I. I, no, I think you were wrong. I think there was some stage friction. Um, but I think it was a time when people oh, were Im staged friction. imagining okay. a lot of friction. Right, well, maybe I did, because your book contradicted what I, what I felt. Uh, <laughs> Am I no, I'm, I'm, what? Is my thing making too much noise? Should oh, I just hold it, it like this? Oh, maybe it's banging against your breasts. Like giant. Yes. <laughs> like giant temporary breasts. Uh, what can we do? <laughs> Is that, just, is that a problem? We'll, we'll see. I'll just try to be very still. Okay. okay. Is that better? I think so. I, th I thought it was me or something. But maybe that is better. It's better. Okay. okay. That's better. So do you want to describe what was going on? Uh, At right that time? Yeah. Well, we had... Um, uh, you were very protective of her, I felt, in the book. I, was, I, I felt a, a mix of emotions going into it because we had... I had been playing her for all of eight weeks, I think. And, you know, usually when you do a character like that at SNL, the lifespan of a, of a character like that is you do it for, you know, uh, two years and then sometimes, then maybe like the person wants to show up and, and talk, there's a uh, sort of an SNL inside term for that, which is called a sneaker upper, which is that thing where 
you know, you do the impression and then the person's there and they pretend to be mad about it. And, um, <laughs> and comedy writers kind of hate that um, thing, the inevitability of that, but audiences, for whatever reason, just kind of like it. So it's, so it's like, I like it. I like it, right? It's a human thing. It's like, it's, it's like New Year's Eve. People just, it's terrible, but people like it. Um, <laughs> it always disappoints and people love it. Uh, and so, and so here we were just only eight weeks into the life of this thing and, and she was going to come on and, and I, I was very conflicted because I was reluctant to do it because it was sort of a weird and increasingly ugly time in the campaign and I thought, and at the same time, um, uh, I was reluctant to do it because I was convinced that if she came into 8-H that that audience would boo her because it's mm -hmm. a New York audience and I was like, well, for sure, they'll boo her and it'll be terribly ugly and I'll be standing next to her and it'll just be a weird moment. She had been booed the week before at a Flyers game in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. my classy hometown. <laughs> um, and, I, <laughs> and I thought, well, this is, and so I remember saying to Lauren, like, well, first he you know, said she wants to come and I, I looked back when I was writing the book to find emails about it. I emailed him uh, something short to the extent of, please don't make me do that. And that email was not answered. And then, and then um, she was coming, and then I said, well, me, you know, I'm worried she's going to be booed, so I think we should start her, maybe you should start her backstage in the hallway like they do sometimes at SNL, and then it won't, people won't know for sure if it's pre-recorded or if it's real. And then and I think Lauren had the idea to put Alec Baldwin next to her because he's sort of this, you know, I think he's the actual, on the liberal flag. I think it's, <laughs> it's Alec with Pegasus wings. Yeah. Riding Ariana Huffington. I think that's the, <laughs> the liberal flag. So I think um, he thought that was a, Lauren was a good smart I think to she do would that. like that, actually. He wouldn't. Um, and so we had, so I was, yeah, I was in this weird position of I was sort of there to make fun of her, but also felt like I wanted to protect her. And then, of course, she came on stage and was a hero's welcome. The audience was thrilled to see her, which I think was, I just underestimated, you know, what a TV star she is. So, <laughs> okay, uh, I know we're still getting a little noise off this, and yeah. if you could turn up this monitor a little bit, I'm having trouble hearing, it's a little boomy in here. And is it, you think it's, it's uh, I don't, it doesn't seem like the mic is moving, mm -hmm. I don't know what that boom sound is. When we did the sound check, I had no shirt on. Oh. And that was... Yeah, that sounds better I'll all of a sudden. It. That's nicer. Thanks, I'll hold uh, it. Down. Maybe That's we can get said. a volunteer to hold <laughs> that. <laughs> no, we can hold it. No, no, hold that's it. okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, but it's interesting, I think, that you are protective. Wow, I just did that, didn't I? Maybe I should hold, I'll hold yours and you hold mine. Uh, that you are uh, protective of the character you are uh, destroying. <laughs> well, I, I think that... Um, the, the, the women I know in sketch comedy compared to the men, and this is a generalization, but I, the, the men are, I feel, more genuinely rebellious and inclined to, and the women I know are all kind of rebellious on stage and off stage are kind of quiet, nice people and good daughters and obedient citizens. And that so sounds like a generalization. It is a yeah. solid one, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a, a true one. Yeah. Now, what I, what I was, I was very surprised to see you do such a complete well-formed uh, impression because I had not known you as, as a sketch player or impressionist. I had known you as the uh, news person behind the desk and I had known you as a writer. Mm -hmm. And then when I read your book, you had this entire history of uh, improvisational work even to the point where you went on the road with a, a road company. So I'm, uh, two things that I want to ask, and to me, you can just, you don't need me anymore because this sounds like a long story. <laughs> that your response, how you got, one, interested in improv, and two, how that led you to writing mm -hmm. on SNL. You weren't hired as, an, as a uh, TV persona on SNL, you were hired as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how that came about. Okay. So how okay. Did, so All right. the first. I'm part just was, gonna <laughs> relax. Anybody have a pillow? Or how I got interested in, in or a improv? Benadryl. Is that the first part? Sorry. Yeah. Part. Well, uh, how how you how you uh, how you became a you you said in your book that 
that improv was extremely important to you, mm -hmm. and you thought it was one of the highest forms of something. Sure. Yeah. Well, I had. I and if you didn't say it, would you mind writing it in my book <laughs> so it make me make me true? You're right. This is going to be a long one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, uh, well, I had um, I had studied um, drama and playwriting at the University of Virginia, mm -hmm. and so I, anybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wahoo! Wah. And. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do something, and I wanted to be on stage, but any time I studied any kind of proper acting technique, it never quite made any sense to me. I, I, we, they tried to teach us Stanislavski and all this stuff, and I, I never knew what I was supposed to really be thinking about during the play, and inevitably I would think about, you know, what I'm going to eat later, and that kind of thing, <laughs> which I knew was wrong, but... Um, and so <laughs> I somehow knew, just from growing up watching Saturday Night Live and SCTV, which were gigantic to me, um, uh, yes, you should clap for that, and um, that I wanted to be like those people. And so I, after I graduated, I moved to Chicago, and um, Chicago, there's going to be so many applause points. I know. Yeah. I bought a you're, Ford. You're a master. You're a master no. at this. Uh, yes. I <laughs> I walked past well, an American flag. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and I, so I went to Chicago. To so you moved to Chicago right to, to, to hopefully to, be in Second City. To try to, yeah, to try to study wow. improv and to be in Second oh. City if I could, to even get in the training center if I could. Mm -hmm. Second City, I love them. Improv Olympic, anyone? Mm. Mm -hmm. There's another theater there that uh, I studied with Del Close, among many yes. other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, old junkies. Yeah. Old dead junkies. Um, that's what he is. I'm surprised that I'm surprised that training center didn't get an applause <laughs> at this rate. Go ahead. Um, and so uh, and so yeah, so I started doing that, and that was something that finally made sense to me because it was sort of a combination of of acting and writing, and it I could. You, I learned that you're only supposed to focus on your partner, and I finally had the answer of like, what am I supposed to be thinking about? And you're supposed to truly mm -hmm. be listening and all that stuff. And so yeah, so we would we would tour around because you're in a play and you're listening. You're like, yeah, I'm listening, but I heard the same thing last night. <laughs> you know, with improv, it's truly different every night. But were you enchanted with show business as a youngster? Uh, yes. Isn't everyone? Doesn't everyone? Well, I was. Sure. But. I mean, I just wondered if you had favorites as a, as a child going, mm -hmm. wow, I, I, that's, what, that's what I want to do. Yeah, I mean, I, there was that block of, of TV that was, um, you know, Mary Tyler Moore and into Bob Newhart, into the Carol Burnett show that was, mm -hmm. you know, that was everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And then SNL and SCTV and mm -hmm. Monty Python and all these things, so the usual uh -huh. suspects. Were you, any other, yes, you. Any other comedians? That, you, of course. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. So go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm. Well, you were on SNL a lot at that time too. That's probably where I would have seen you, then. Or maybe this, maybe tonight is the first time you've actually <laughs> met me. I don't know. But. So, so how did the writing? I'm very curious how you got from. Tell us about your life on. That, is that where you met Amy Poehler first? Yes. Of so all? then Amy yeah. Poehler and I were on a. You better clap for Amy. Oh, yeah. Amy Poehler and I were in our first uh, improv team together at Improv Olympic, and then we were in the same touring company together at the Second City, which meant there were uh, eight of us in a van that would drive around for $75 a show, and, but sometimes you would have to drive two days to get to the show and then drive two days back. <laughs> right. It was not... So you'd make $75 for yes. five days. Yes. <laughs> but it was show business. Ooh. Yeah. And... Um, and even then, you know, I had, and I was still studying playwriting on the side in Chicago, and even then I sort of knew that within, my purpose within the company was kind of a writer's purpose to help generate ideas and stuff, mm -hmm. and that there were other people that were more the character people. Mm -hmm. um, but I just thought, well, but I'm in, I'm in the door, you know, so that I can... And were you actually at that point writing things down on a page to remember them, or just mostly pitching and improvising and we would, suggesting? Yeah, we would mostly... Um, we would come up with areas sometimes, and uh, and that we would the second city method is that you improvise and then kind of re-improvise and, and re-improvise, which is a weird 
in between skill mm -hmm. to technically still be improvising but try to hit certain right. beats. Um, and then eventually you would set it, which means you would, I guess eventually someone would type right. it up, but mostly you just kind of memorized what you're supposed to do. And how did that lead you to Lorne Michaels' office? <laughs> what year would that, that have been? That was 1997. And how many years had you been in Chicago and on the road? And first of all, I, I hate to skip over what fun that must have been in it's, that van yeah. with Amy Poehler. Yeah. How many, how many women and how many men? That was, uh, in the touring company, it was usually three women and three men and uh, a stage manager and a piano player. And you would go around and it was, it was really, really, it was really fun. And you could, in Chicago, you can have such a great life. Because then eventually you get into, I got into the main stage company, so that was really a living wage. And you would, yeah, you would go hang out in Chicago all day and then go do the show at night. And it's the, it's the best uh, lifestyle you can have. A million laughs. A million laughs. Yeah. yeah. A lot of nachos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so it, when you get to, by the time you get to Lorne Michaels' office, which you, you went, uh, Tina went in and had a, uh, I guess a, an interview mm -hmm. with Lorne as a writer, you must have had some credits to your name or? Well, I was in the main stage company at, at Second City and they had, they, they had come to Talent Scout Second City once or twice and were not interested in me as a performer. Well, that's crazy. It's, uh, it's not that crazy. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then uh, a friend of mine, Adam McKay, who um, was, had left Second ah, City. Ah, yeah. Adam McKay, okay. McKay was the head writer. And so I emailed him and said, I want to apply for a writing job. Mm -hmm. So you write a submission, which are invariably terrible. You work really hard on them, and they're always, I've now read hundreds and hundreds of them, and they're, it, they're painful. They're hard, hard, very hard to do. And, um, and, but I think because, you know, Adam knew me a little bit, so I got to come in and have the interview mm -hmm. and meet Lauren. And how did that go? You describe an anecdote in your book. Yeah, which is, do you want to go there or sure, not? Sure, sure. I met Lauren. Um, I came from Chicago like on my day off from Second City with my little weird short haircut and my chenille sweater from Contempo Casuals. <laughs> and, I, and I went up to meet Lauren, and the only thing that anyone had advised me was, whatever you do, don't finish his sentences. And um, a woman I knew in Chicago had felt that she had made that mistake and it had cost her the job. And I was like, go, okay, I'm gonna go in there, I'm not gonna blow this. And they finally called me in and, and I sat across, across from Lauren and he just looked at me and said, so you're from? <laughs> <laughs> and my heart was just in my mouth. I was like, don't finish it, don't finish it, whatever you don't, don't finish it. And I, it just seemed to hang there for so long that I really thought someone was just gonna come in after an hour and just say like, you can go now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and finally I couldn't take it anymore and I just, right as I was blurting out, like, I'm from Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, he finished, he was like, Chicago. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's it. That's, I've blown it. But he hired you. He did hire me. He trusted yeah. Adam. And I, I know now that so much of what those job interviews are about, you look at the packet, you look for any glimmer of hope in the sketch packet, anything, anything that you haven't seen a hundred times, and you trust someone to vouch that this person is not crazy. And that's it. Yeah. And tell us about your relationship to Lauren. How did it develop? You, you were there for how many years? I was at SNL for nine years. And you ascended from a lowly writer mm -hmm. to head writer. Over how many years did that take? Um, it was actually about two and a half years, three years before I was the head writer because Adam didn't want to do it anymore. He wanted to go and do movies and stuff. And uh, they asked me to do it. Um, That's an amazing climb in two and a half years. It was quick. Yeah, I think it was just the timing of... <laughs> and I, I think a lot of what, what makes someone a good head writer is not, it's not necessarily that they're the funniest person, but they ha they're sort of conscientious and they ah. can be a good liaison for the other writers, right. you know what I mean? And they'll get in there and... And as head writer, are you editing their material? At SNL, all the writers have a lot of autonomy. It's why when they leave, they're absolute monsters because they're just given so much freedom. They can, every week, there's a show where you can write whatever you want every week. Even if someone else says, I'm writing that too. You can go like, well, I'm writing it too. Let's see. <laughs> That's such a waste of time and energy. 
Like some, <laughs> um, can't do that on a sitcom. Oh, you're writing a story about the doctor? Me too. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, and then you get to follow through your own piece. Um, you are becoming right, a producer. You're on the floor with it and yeah. working with the actors. And, and you really ultimately, you know, I, the head writer can say to you, you know, we need to cut a page and we need to do this. But you weirdly kind of, if you have the guts to do it, you can say, no, I really want to, I really want to try it this way. And you usually are, are given permission to do it. And did you ever come up against writers who, at, at dress, did you find that writers were generally willing, once they learned that a page was bombing or a joke was bombing, that they would take it out, or would they fight for it and die with it? Um, usually, dress is a great proving ground because it's really like there's the audience; You're they're right. really letting you know. Um, but I think every writer, myself included, has moments of imaginary uh, laughter. We're like, I think it <laughs> <Yeah>. played. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the yeah. other one that people say when they're deluding themselves is they go, God, it really made us laugh. Yeah. <laughs> really made us like you're yeah. deluding yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have an entire chapter in your book devoted to your father, but not to me. <laughs> Just... <laughs> no, you're, you, it's a very interesting chapter about your father. How, do you want to talk about your father sure. and the relationship to him? Yeah. My dad is a, um, I, just, I describe him as he's a great American. He's mm -hmm. a member of the silent generation. He fought mm -hmm. in Korea. He is um, a Renaissance man. He's, he was a fireman. He was a code breaker in Korea, actually, I should say. It's, he, didn't, he wasn't in comedy. He was a code breaker. And he is a painter. He, my mom is Greek. He taught himself Greek. Um, he's just like a really impressive guy and a uh, kind of naturally intimidating guy. Well, he looks like Clint Eastwood, and he has this kind of naturally stern countenance that, uh, as a kid, would terrify me. I would be at a Little League game or something, and, or, I, you know, like I would be in a Little League game, and, and uh, he would say, you're not concentrating. And I would say, I am concentrating. And he'd say, you just think you're concentrating. <laughs> it's like, so exhausting for a nine-year-old kid. I'm like, <laughs> Um, but I think it, you know, imparted a real uh, kind of work ethic and a desire to please him that has actually uh, paid off. Well. But it sounds like you have a great relationship with him. I do. Yeah. yeah. And it, you, you re describe him as a conservative politically, yes. and you're obviously liberal in your politics. And how does that work itself out? It, you know, it works fine. It's, um, yeah, I might describe him as a Goldwater Republican, and I, I emailed him saying, is that, does that sound about right to you, a Goldwater Republican? And he emailed me the longest answer. I should have printed it. He's like, yes, I... And then he like, listed five books that he's read, read recently. Yeah. Because um, he's, he's, he, it's hard, because he's... Um, even if you want to kind of argue uh, any political point with him, which we don't particularly, he has read ten more things than you. Mm -hmm. And so he's just like... As, never mind. And does he come down to the show and yeah, does he, he comes, enjoy the show? He, he, he loves to come, he's come, both my parents used to come to SNL a fair amount and, and he comes to 30 Rock and, and I talk about this in the book but there's something about my dad that when certain, when powerful men meet him, they, he kind of registers with them in a very specific way. When Lauren met him, he was like, your father is impressive. Mm -hmm. and, like, mm. and he's really dapper, you know, and, and Alec Baldwin was the same. He was like, this is your father, huh? And I think it's, you can see them kind of piecing something together. Something about you, you mean? Yes. Like they're, they're gathering something about you from meeting and your father? I think so, that I'm not just this horrible squat ethnic woman <laughs> that they thought I was. <laughs> you know, that leads me to something. No. What? Well, you know, I've looked over your book, and I, I'm very interested in the package of your book, because you have a, you know, a, everything that, you know, you're a very pretty woman, you always have been. Thank you. And, and, <laughs> and yet, you know, the cover is sort of, a, if you look at, there's a nice picture of Tina, and then with man's hairy arms, and then on the back, there's sort of an, you know, a photo of yourself when you were a young girl you describe as the worst haircut, a terrible haircut, and then every, every quote is, is a parody of a quote, it's sort of uh, negative. Here's a quote from a college boyfriend, you'd be really pretty if you lost weight. 
Um, here's a quote from your father. I hope that's not really the cover. That's really going to hurt sales. <laughs> These are, they're all real, by the way. Those are both real. Pardon me? Those are both real. I, I understand yeah. that those are real. Uh, <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Once in a generation, a woman comes along who changes everything. Tina Fey is not that woman. There's, <laughs> there's a, you know, there's, it's humor, but you also go to every opportunity to sort of deny, deny your own, kind of deny a talent. I know it's done in a parody sense. I'm just wondering if there's something psychological going on here or, you know. Well, we talked I about mean, the Earl Scruggs wants incident. A, pardon me? There was, the Earl Scruggs incident was formative. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, did, it, did, did, did the book company fight you on all yes. these negative the, things? No, the back, they, they, did, they were not keen on this cover. Uh, they wanted a more neutral cover. And for me, I felt like this was, I just wanted to make sure this looked different than a magazine article where, you, mm -hmm. you're, where it's a magazine presenting you. And, and um, I don't know what this says about me that that's how I preferred to present myself. But yeah. I, I said, yeah, let's for sure, let's do nice Photoshop up here and nice makeup. But I wanted to make sure there was some kind of joke to the picture. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very um, confusing line that, that, that women have to walk because you want to look good enough that they let you stay in show business, but you don't want to become carried away. You don't, you don't, I mean, I don't really care truly that much about whether it's about being fancy. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I think that, I know, I think that's uh, admirable. It really is. Uh, it, it is admirable. Then, um, <laughs> to not being fancy. Yes. Well, there was, you know, there Pardon was a, a review of the book, this sort of thing, but there was uh, somewhere, somewhere, maybe here in Los Angeles, the, um, where the lady said, like, well, you know, she posed in the cover of Vanity Fair, just like Wonder Woman, and I didn't. And I thought, oh no, it's, that's the end of her. She's looking overconfident. And now this book cover where she's just not owning it. And I, I feel like I want to say sometimes people like, just can you yourself take a Polaroid of how you would like me to pose in things? Because <laughs> yeah. it's always, it's, it's too far one way or the other. And there's no pleasing anyone. Yeah, I just wonder, uh, well, I, 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 this leads me to this, this fabulous section in the book. Uh, there's a section called the internet in which uh, Tina writes answers to some, uh, what do you call them, little, little blog postings, postings on, on the internet that she found about herself. I don't know if you actually posted that. I assume you didn't. I didn't post them, but they are real. The, the initial the, things the, are the, real. The, the postings are real, these comments about Tina, and then she wrote, uh, I guess, uh, uh, responses that you would like to make. I wanted to treat them like genuine right. correspondence. Right. So I, I'd like to read these to you because they're just so brilliant. It's, it's, uh, this is from, D, uh, D, it doesn't matter where the website is, but <laughs> po posted by Centurius on Monday, 9-21-2009 at 2.08 a.m. <laughs> Tina Fey is an ugly, pear-shaped, bitchy, overrated troll. Dear Centurius, first let me say how inspiring it is that you have learned to use a computer. <laughs> I hate for our correspondence to be confrontational, but you have offended me deeply. To say I'm an overrated troll when you have never even seen me guard a bridge is patently unfair. I'll leave it for others to say if I'm the best, but I am certainly one of the most dedicated trolls guarding bridges today. I always ask three questions, at least two of which are riddles. As for ugly, pear-shaped, and bitchy, I prefer the terms offbeat, business class asked, and exhausted. But I'll take what I get. There's no such thing as bad press. Now go to bed, you crazy night owl. <laughs> you have to be at NASA early in the morning. <laughs> so they can look for your penis with the Hubble telescope. <laughs> 
Uh, this is another one uh, posted by Jerk Store <laughs> on Wednesday, 11.21 p.m. In my opinion, Tina Fey completely ruined SNL. The only reason she's celebrated is because she's a woman and an outspoken liberal. She's not, she has not a single funny bone in her body. Dear Jerk Store, huzzah for the truth teller. Women in this country have been over-celebrated for too long. <laughs> just, just last night, <laughs> there was a story on my local news about a missing girl, <laughs> and they must have dedicated seven or eight minutes to where she was last seen and how she might have been abducted by a close family friend. And I thought, what is this? The news for chicks? <laughs> <laughs> then there was some story about Hillary Clinton flying to some country because she's Secretary of State. Why do we keep talking about these dum-dums? We are a society that constantly celebrates no one but women, and it must stop. I want to hear what men of the world have been up to. What, what fun new guns have they invented? What are they raping these days? What, what's Michael Bay's next film going to be? When I first set out to ruin, when I first set out to ruin SNL, I didn't think anyone would notice. But I persevered because, like you, trying to do a nine-piece jigsaw puzzle, <laughs> it was a labor of love. I'm not one to toot my own horn, but I feel safe with you, jerk store. So I'll say it. Everything you ever hated on SNL was by me, and everything you ever liked was by someone else you, who did it against my will. <laughs> Sincerely, Tina Fey. P.S. You know who does have a funny bone in her body? Your mom every night for a dollar. <laughs> that is. Um. Now that was just a fabulous piece of vindictive writing. It was. Just getting even. And, you know, I, it brings me to something that I should have covered earlier. You, you, you quoted in the book later that Sarah Palin had said that you and Katie Couric had exploited and profited from her family. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think she said that in some documentary. Right. I was like, I'm pretty sure I got 400 bucks every time I did that Sarah Palin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then Before you commented that it was posted on the internet and was viewed, I think, 58 million times. Yeah, those sketches were uh, something like uh, some crazy, f yeah, those Sarah Palin sketches were watched like 58 million times or something on YouTube. And you get nothing for that. And you get nothing for that. And of course, Sarah Palin had a reality show yes. where she <laughs> profited from her own family. <laughs> um, Oh, I want to talk about, first of all, two, two things. You tell me which is more interesting to talk about. We're going to talk about them both. You can tell me which is more interesting to talk about first. Um, one is how did the style of 30 Rock evolve? Mm -hmm. Because it's quite a unique show. It's, it's a weird show. Yeah. And so did it... Did you always have this sort of plan for it in mind, or did it slowly evolve? I think it evolved somewhat quickly over the first season. Um, we, I, I had written the pilot, um, and I had sort of uh, known that once I could figure out, okay, well, if I, have, if I can get Alec Baldwin, and then Tracy, Morgan, and me, that there would be this kind of triangle of characters with um, completely different points of view on any issue that would come up work, gender, sex, women's basketball, business, they, they would, and you would hopefully be able to align them in all kinds of different ways. And so that's what we started out with. And then the show, it, 
it's funny because I was made to watch some of the pilot and stuff recently, and it's so um, glacially slow now, the first three episodes, compared mm -hmm. to it just keeps getting faster and faster mm -hmm. and faster. Um, and I think when we did those first 12 episodes, one, we didn't save anything because we didn't think we would be there that long. So any idea that we had that we liked, we shoved it in immediately, which that's how the shows, I think, got more and more dense, and we do three and four stories per show. Um, and then the, I think Robert Carlock, who's my partner in running the show, um, he's brilliant, yeah. And he, and he brings a certain kind of Harvard sensibility to it that I think um, that we let the show get weirder and weirder. Um, I talk in the book about the, the 11th episode that we did right before we, we had an order of 12, and we did this episode that was called, ultimately called Black Tie, but when we were shooting it, we were kept calling it um, Goodbye America. <laughs> <laughs> because it was about, um, it was about uh, Jack Donaghy take, uh, inviting me to come to a Black Tie event um, for his, his friend, uh, Gerhard Habsburg, who was an inbred Austrian prince, <laughs> played by Paul Rubens. So it was like, and, and while we kept trying at the core, we kept trying to have it be a story about, um, oh, Jack and Liz, it was a very season one story of like, Liz is worried that it might be a date, but it's not a date. And we tried to have this emotional thing with his ex-wife showing up and Isabella, Isabella Rossellini playing Jack's ex-wife. And, um, and it just, that was the one where it was like, all our good intentions to be responsible team players and try to give the network a show that had a lady in the workplace doing things like it just, once that got, Gerhardt showed up with one like tiny ivory hand. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he's really funny and he does all these, you know, he's, they find, it's his birthday and then you find out he's only 21, but he's just so sickly and he's like, I'm finally old enough to rent a car. He's just like, <laughs> then it was sort of like, that's where the show is. It's that weird stuff. Well, I'm curious when you, when you started doing these cutaways these almost little cutaways to a person's thought or these little films inside the story or these really uh, cut, cutting away to unreality in a sense in the middle of a, the real characters and, and understanding that you could get away with it yeah. and still have the audience believing in these characters. It's a, it's a real breakthrough. Thanks. It was, it was, I can't remember how soon in we started doing, I think within a I can't remember if there were any in the pilot, but yeah, there, there was, we tried to figure out what the language of them was, and it was it, usually if it was replacing dialogue that would have been about a shared memory, so instead of saying, remember that time you and I went to the thing, right. and it, would it would whip back, but oh. then sometimes it's not that, sometimes it's just right. crazy. But it's elaborate to shoot that, because so suddenly instead of having dialogue, yeah. you've got to go to another location. What we've burdened ourselves with is, you know, what should be, like, it, we're writing it like it's The Simpsons, but we have to actually go to all these places. Yeah. And I have to pay all these actors instead of having like one guy playing ten people. There's ten guys. <laughs> it's a terrible business. Now, model. How, tell us about Alec Baldwin. I, I want to share my anecdote. When I did the show, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have an anecdote, but I'll get to that. <laughs> um, and how, how, did the, how, does, how does your relationship with them? In fact, I'll read you the question that I wrote that I just realized I went by. It said, do you want to talk about your working relationship with Alec Baldwin, or would you rather I go fuck myself right now? That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, all, I'm always, always happy to talk about uh, my working relationship with Alec Baldwin. I mean, he, he is the reason the show got on the air. He's the only professional actor on the show. No, that's not true. <laughs> no, that's not true. We have Jane Kukowski. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it is mostly some people we found on the street. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Oh, well, not our guests. I'm yeah. talking about our core cast. Yeah. <laughs> our real regular cast. Um, and he, uh, he, you know, he, he took that character off the page of Jack Donaghy and made it, um, it's, uh, I think, um, one of those nice moments in television where the actor and the character are just truly kind of come up and excel. Um, I think, you know, what else do you want to know? Well, now, when I, when I did the show, uh, we were shooting, and there was a, 
I can't remember what the joke was, but there was about, we had about a page and a half of a scene. And there was a one bit in the middle where I was supposed to, I think, spill water on myself mm -hmm. or something. And, and I, I didn't quite trust it, mm -hmm. but I was willing to do it. But I knew it was a page yeah. and it was going to take another two and a half hours to shoot it. Mm -hmm. And Alex's style was this. He walked over to the head writer. I think it was Robert, was it, right? Yeah, well, I wasn't there. Okay, well, I can't remember who it was. But anyway, and he, and he just said, um, um, he goes, okay, uh, this doesn't work. And, um, and the head writer said, uh, says, well, I uh, think it might, I think it'll, it'll work. I think that, that could work. And, and, my, and my secret head, I'm going, it's not going to work. But I, I thought, yeah, well, you know, we'll shoot it and see it. Yeah, I'm just visiting the set. And he goes, he goes, no, this, out. So we'll go from here, we'll go from here. And I'm thinking, yay, I don't have to yeah. shoot it. Can but, I say something? Can I say something? He was showing off for you. Really? He does not do that usually. Really? Yeah, no. I think he, and, he, and you, what, your, both of your instinct was probably right, and it was also an earlier season where hopefully now we would also have enough experience to know, like, oh, that's going to be four more setups, let's not do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I think I he was showing so. up. I don't know. Yeah. I, think, I think his instinct was right. His instinct was right, but yeah. the voicing it. Oh, really? That was for hmm. you. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, now let me just check the time. Okay, I'm out of questions. But uh, <laughs> now we've been on here actually, wait, 45 what do we time we start? We started at, no, we started, okay, I gotta be careful. Well, I'm out of question. Around four. Oh, I'm gonna talk about, pardon me? <laughs> we started around four. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> um, your life, uh, your gender uh, issues in your life. <laughs> and in work. Is that a funny question? I, I don't did, know. I did finally settle on one. Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, a little slow. Um, I, I think in your book you described SNL was pretty well on its way to uh, equality. Mm -hmm. uh, but you tell, but how how were things at Second City? There were some good stories in there. Oh yeah, okay. it was an interesting sort of road up in that people are. A, a lot, a, a very often people will say, want to ask, oh, SNL, it was such a boys club, was that difficult for you? And, and um, for many reasons, it, it, it was not. I mean, first of all, I think I was there at a very lucky time. I think if you talk to Jane Curtin um, uh, or Lorraine Newman, they might have a different experience, even up through, you know, Janine Garofalo, I think, had a very different experience than Amy mm -hmm. and Molly and, and Anna and I had. Um, because there was strength in numbers and there were more of us. And the world had kind of changed a little bit. Right. Even the fact that there were more women in media in other places to parody and more women in politics to parody. It helped the women get on the show more easily. Um, and also when people say like, oh, SNL is so hard for women, I was like, but did you notice that women are often, from the beginning, have been stars on SNL? Right, and really funny. Really always. funny, That's why I always. didn't understand it. And then it's sort of, I find that it's when they leave SNL is where the gender disparity seems to happen, that the men go on to be very successful movie ah, stars and the uh -huh, women uh -huh. less so, um, and not because of their ability. But, um, uh, but Second City was a place where it was, the, the, you know, it was an older institution. It had been around since, it's been around since 1959. And they would, the, the companies, the touring companies were three men, three women, but the main stage companies were always four men and two women. And they would improvise the show and make it up. And, the, and the, the reasoning behind it was always like, well, there won't be enough parts for the girls if we have three and three. It was like, but they're, they're making it up. <laughs> it was like a big hole in the logic there. Um, and I think there was, a, there was sort of a semi-unspoken thing of like, listen, if you're a woman in Second City and you leave with a husband or a television career, I, either one is good. If you find a husband, you know, <laughs> Joyce would be just as happy if you left yeah. with a husband. As you look back over your now lengthy career. Almost really. done. What? No, no. <laughs> no, don't you, first of all, don't you think you're going to be in show business your whole life? I hope so. Yeah. I, it's pretty fun. I mean, I think it's, it's very clear that you're going to be in show business because, you know, um, 
One is that you're a writer, and you, it's not a person, you're not, you're not a person who's going to be sitting, uh, got anything for me today, Mr. Agent? Uh, you'll be creating, creating your things for your whole life. But I'm looking back, uh, what, what are some of your, oh, first of all, I just want to comment, I'll tell you a story about Tina. That I've had a couple of experiences working with her, and uh, once we were asked to present, co-present co on the Oscars, and so we're emailing back and forth, and they said, what do you think about this? And, you know, and she read that, so I said, yeah, it sounds like something could be fun, but I, I don't know, what, what, what would we do? I send that email to her, and it's like an hour goes by, and she goes, I get an email back, it says, how about this? And there's attached, you know, a two-page bit, all written. <laughs> I'm going, yeah, that, that's, that's good. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what we did. And it was, it was great. And then um, you asked me to appear in Baby Mama. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I said, sure, I'd love to read it. And I, and I did it just based on, it was so funny. My, my role was so funny. It's a, g a great a dream for a comedy actor to get something that's actually funny to do that you don't have to work on or worry about or try to make funny. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I'm looking back over your, the things you're, your half a career so far, <laughs> uh, are, are things that stick out that you think, oh, I really like that, or, or I really hate that, or embarrassed by that? Uh -huh. I mean, um, our whole lives, I know, we're more embarrassed by the things that didn't work than we are pleased by the things that did work. Right. But. Um, I mean, at SNL, you do, you have to get used to that there are going to be things, especially if you're going to take on that head writer thing, you're going you're, you're gonna to take some bullets for the team. You're going to be called in to write a monologue that just... Yeah. Doesn't work, or you're gonna, um, things that I, things that I did, I am proud of. Um, uh, I, uh, a f I wrote a commercial parody called Mom Jeans, that um, uh -huh. that I still like. And uh, I find, you, I don't, know, do you find this to be true that sometimes the things, if you're writing, the things that kind of come out the quickest, often work. Yeah. And the more labored they are. Mm -mm. Um, I'm agreeing just because you're here, but I like. I like yeah. <laughs> Um, that was weird. Um, I wrote a, uh, there was one time I wrote, I wrote a sketch with Rachel Dratch um, that when we wrote it, yeah, Rachel Dratch. When she's we, so great. I want to say Rachel so Dratch funny. is hilariously funny. Oh, she's she so was funny. the one character in a sketch that if she had no lines, my eye would still go to her. <laughs> yeah. She was just so, she wasn't stealing the scene, she was just so involved in it yeah. all her the time. Yeah, her face is so, yeah. and she was, I was on, uh, in the main company with her at Second City, and she and Scott Adsit were the stars, uh, that you could tell, like, you know, when you, there's nothing uh, sadder than when you do your nightly curtain call uh, one at a time, and you, and someone <laughs> is the applause dip, <laughs> yeah. and then everyone, yeah. uh, like, yeah! <laughs> and yeah. she and, and yeah. Scott were, for sure, mm -hmm. the, the stars, um, but we had written this sketch together that, when we were writing it, we thought it was the funniest we couldn't stop laughing and it was um and it was uh and it bombed at the table the next day it just bombed and then we brought it back uh, with a different host and it did eventually go in the air um, it was about a show like a barney type show and she played a girl who had uh developed over the summer and no <laughs> one could no one wanted to break it to her that, and and rachel very bravely used her own assets and did a lot of like jumping and, and like, there were a lot, you know, like unfortunate lyrics of like let's do the bouncy bouncy song and then and, and we did eventually air with um with Ray Liotta as the the dinosaur who was just like you gotta tell her it's horrifying what about the story about the uh the commercial parody you have in the book yes. that the guys didn't get yes yeah. there, this was um uh, my friend Paula Pell who's here tonight is a mad genius this, I say, this was sort of my proudest moment as head, as head writer at SNL because it was helping someone else get their thing on TV. And Paula had written this really funny commercial uh, called Kotex Classic, which was um, <laughs> at the time when classic was a big marketing trend and everything was Coke Classic and Re whatever, you know, Keds Classic. And she had written this commercial, it was Kotex Classic, and it was meant for the, the women in the cast to be these like sassy ladies about town with a large sort of medical <laughs> belt <laughs> rising above their low-rise jeans. And, <laughs> and um, she kept submitting it, I think, you know, maybe over more than one season. And, uh, and we would go to pick the parodies, and it was kind of, it would just get overlooked. And so I was advocating for the piece, and, and um, 
and there we have <laughs> the guys now. They're claiming like we knew what it meant. I've had to I've had to smooth over a few um, uh, relationships over this story. But um, it, what became clear was they finally I finally said we really really need to look at this one. And they sat down and said, okay, let's have a meeting about it. How would we shoot it? Would would we see blood? Would they have to have their <laughs> pants off? Like, and for me, in that moment, it became clear like oh, of course because you guys never had this experience, like when you are, I'm 40, when we would go to the nurse, if you had your period in like 10th, 9th grade, you, unexpected, you would go to the nurse and she would take out like a box that she'd had since the 50s <laughs> and give you, and you'd be like, what is this? She'd give you these ancient things. <laughs> and of course they had never had that experience. And so it was, it, it made me realize that when there sometimes were gender differences there, it wasn't intentional. It was just that we had different, um, experiences. I love your story in the book about Amy uh, pitching something. You oh, said it was Jimmy. kind of, uh, yeah, it's like a seminal experience for yeah, you. Yeah, this was, I had been at the show for a couple years and it was, it was actually the, it must have been the fall of 2001 that Amy joined the show um, and uh, I had been there since 97, I guess, and, as a writer and, and she was new to the show but she was very confident because she had had her own show before she had, the Upright Citizens Brigade had had a show. And, yep. And uh, they were doing, around the big read-through table, before we actually started the table read, she was goofing around doing some kind of bit that neither one of us can quite remember what it was, but it must have been something a little bit crass or vulgar. And she was, you know, doing something gross or whatever. And, um, and Jimmy Fallon, who was kind of the star of the show at the time, was seated next to her. And he looked at her and, and said, um, he's like, stop it, I don't, stop doing that, it's not cute, I don't like it. And he was kind of like teasing her about it. And she, when I knew this about her personality, but she just kind of was doing it. And then he said, stop it, it's not cute. And she wheeled on him and just said, I don't fucking care if you like it. <laughs> and then just went back to doing whatever she was doing. And, and she, she startled him, and, and I just and I was sitting there, and I just remember that moment being like, "Oh, things is gonna change around here." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Seely, <laughs> Harpo don't gonna change around here. <laughs> now, um, I think it's time to uh, take some questions from the audience. Okay. Um, I have no idea how this is going to be done because we can't see a thing. We'll hear things, I now, guess. We have uh, someone in the audience with a mic. Ted is running Oh, the around. lights are coming up. Now, please, can I just say one thing? Do not request a hug. <laughs> and please, no request for autographs. It's just too impossible. But we have people, I'm not going to choose um, because that puts too much pressure on me. We have uh, some people in the audience with mics, and we need. Uh, so you, don't don't wave to me. Wave to the guy with the mic. Hello. Hello. Okay. And the general rule is: questions start with a W or an H and are short. Okay. But what we need to. What's a W or H for? I couldn't hear you. Could you hear? Her? No, we can't hear. Her. Say it again. I can hear. But what is your favorite Thirty Rock episode? Oh, okay. I think she's asking me. Okay. Yeah. No, go ahead. Um, uh, I have many. First of all, of course, the one that, that uh, Steve is in. Oh, you don't have to do that. Gavin <laughs> Valore. Um, other than that, uh, I think my favorites are, there's an episode that Robert Carlock wrote called Apollo, Apollo from, I think, our fourth season, third season. I actually think it's wrong in the book. Whatever's in the book is wrong. Um, where um, Jack is reliving his childhood dream of, um, he's trying to recapture the magic of his childhood. And I also got to do this, like, um, of, they find an old ad that Liz did for sort of a phone sex um, <laughs> service <laughs> that the writers find on the internet. I don't remember the episode, but I remember Alec dressing up like a Mexican. What was oh, that? Oh, that's the Generalissimo, yeah. That was hilarious. That was a good one. Hilarious. We didn't get to your favorite bits that you loved through the years, but well, let's take questions, sense. yeah. Tina, what was the thing that when you were on the writing staff, I'm over here, yay. Over uh, here. <laughs> over here, oh, you're here. What was the first sketch where they wanted you to be an actor on SNL, and were you scared? What were your feelings behind that? Um, uh, well, uh, I was occasionally in monologues as a writer, because the writers sometimes are in the monologue, and I, um, 
Uh, it, I, it's much harder to have one line in something than to be in the whole thing. And I remember I did, I was in a monologue when Gwyneth Paltrow hosted, and I was, it was, the joke was that she was sort of talking in a British accent, and I was supposed to get up, raise, raise my hand and say, aren't you from New York? And then uh, in, in, in dress rehearsal, I raised my hand and said, aren't you from England? <laughs> New York? <laughs> New York. And um, so that's, that might have been the first time <laughs> that they let me be on camera. Uh, sup, Tina. Sup, Steve. Sup. Hi, guys. Maybe you can um, say stage left or stage right so uh, we know where to I look. I don't know. I have to figure out where you're looking. I'm left okay. on your side. I'm right on everyone else's okay. oh, side. Oh, there you go. I'm here. I'm tall. Hi. Um, yeah, so I was hoping you might be able to talk a little bit about um, being a pop culture nerd slash Star Wars chick because I feel like Star Wars hasn't been mentioned once tonight. And as a little bit of a, a pop culture nerd myself, it's, it's nice to hear you talk about that kind of stuff. Sure. I, so the question was, um, yeah. Yeah, it was hard if to I could go. talk about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was a Star Wars nerd as a kid. Um, I um, more than one, thank you. Yeah, it's really unique. No one, no, no one is really into that movie but me. Um, and uh, I did, uh, for um, Halloween once as a kid, I dressed up as C-3PO, not Princess Leia. Um, and so, so, and the writers are, of course, are all a bunch of nerds. And so we, we do have, uh, over the years, have had many Star Wars references. Only once or twice have I let them give me something Star Wars to say that was beyond my actual um, Star Wars knowledge. Um, I can't remember them now. I think there was one time where I was like, all right, now I'm cheating, because this is high-level nerdery. Stage Anyone right. Stage right. Yes. Hi, Tina. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you have, how, what's your work ethic to have all these scripts going at the same time, and how do you work with actors? Are you open to improv, or... Is it pretty 99% structured when you're actually shooting? Um, it is about 99% structured when we're shooting one because we have sometimes eight to 10 pages a day to shoot. Um, but we, uh, that's with 30 Rock. Um, what was the first part of the question? How, Oh, with work ethic. Um, it just, it's, um, you know, SNL is actually pretty good training because you just, you have to, perf you have to turn something in every week. You have to turn in about 20 pages every week. And then with 30 Rock, you, you, you just have to, you can't really procrastinate much because it's a sort of a bullet train that just doesn't stop. Any, any um, single camera comedy is like that. But uh, I also, we have a staff of about 10 or 12 writers who, um, who shoulder most of that burden these days. Yes, Steve. <laughs> I'm curious when you when you do a movie as opposed to you know TV is very fast paced and there's always the next week. I, I, that's was my experience when I was writing on TV and a movie is very slow paced. Uh, if, if does it annoy you doing a movie after doing television? Well, it's sort of a nice change up. Um, I think I, you think if I only did movies, I think it would annoy me. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think it would annoy uh, the moviegoers as well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, you live so long with jokes if you write a movie, you know, and then by right. the time you get to shoot them, you're like, I don't know about this joke anymore. Yeah, and then it's, and, and the audience doesn't see it for a year, Yeah. by the way. I'm to your left. I was wondering if you and Alec would ever consider hosting the Oscars in character as Jack and Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Who would host the Oscars in character? That would be, uh, yep, well, yeah, we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. And I'll be off to the side like, <laughs> and I'll wear jeans to the Oscars. A question, when you were young, at what age were you Wait able a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, uh, were you able to uh, stay up to watch the end of Saturday Night Live? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know when, I, I, somehow I have memories of seeing the first five years of, of SNL that they it must have been through repeats or something because I was only five when the show started, but um, yeah, I think I was a lot, in the, I think I, my parents let us stay up in the name of comedy very late. Did your parents enjoy comedy? Were they? Yes, yeah. big, mm -hmm. big comedy fans, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. Over here? Uh, Hi, oh, Steve. To the left, 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 left. Can't see anything. Fire away. Can't see. Left. Very, 
the left? Okay, if you I'm saw what I saw, you, 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 I just see um, 5,000 people. Gotcha, I gotcha. <laughs> One person Hi. going. Hi, Tina, it's my birthday. <laughs> to Come the again? left. D just, it's good. And just the just question go. is, where'd you get your shoes? Oh. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Steve. You know, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Finally, something about me. I have had these shoes. First of all, can we just settle in? Because this is a really good story. I've had these shoes for 35 years. And I used to wear them on stage as, uh, when I was doing a stand-up comedy. And when I bought them, they were too tight for me. And I thought, well, but I really like them. I thought, I only wear them an hour a day. And I'll, uh, it'll be fine for an hour a day, and I'll just break them in by wearing them an hour a night. And now they feel great. <laughs> and then, <laughs> the laces. Sorry, I'll say next. <laughs> I like the light idea on the people, that's good. Because then if they ask a stupid question, everybody sees them. <laughs> Hello? Where are you Hi. now, Ted? Uh, uh, stage right for you, uh, house left uh, for everyone. Wow, that's a show business <laughs> person good. right there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hi, uh, this question could be answered by both of you guys, because I love you both a lot. Um, but uh, who, who have you not worked with yet that you would like to in the future? That's a good question. Um, I'll go first and say Catherine O'Hara. Catherine O'Hara. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't want to ask her to stand up, but Catherine O'Hara is in the audience tonight. <laughs> she is truly one of the great yeah. uh, so Comedian, improvisers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and fine person. And what about you, Steve? What about who, me? Who have you not worked with that you well, would like to work with? Certainly not Catherine O'Hara. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I've worked with so many great people. I don't know. I've, what about if, uh, you know, living or dead? Is there anyone? Living or dead? Does that make it more interesting? Uh, well, you put me on the spot here. I. Uh, you know, I, I may, mainly I, you know, I worked once with Mike Nichols, oh, that's uh, but it was a play. I would like to work with Mike Nichols as a, a film director, certainly. That's good. Yeah. Judd Apatow is in the audience. I would love to work with him sometime. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I want to, I want to swear in a movie. <laughs> <and that would've laughs> okay, we can so, go to another question. This is kind yeah. of fun now. <laughs> <laughs> to your left. Hey Tina, hey Steve, huge hey. fan, just saying, spotlight, awesome. Uh, I just had a question for Tina. Um, what was it like writing for Mean Girls, and did you choose, yes, Mean Girls, did you choose your character as I, Ms. Nor Ms. Norbury? Um, uh, yes, uh, well, yes, Mean Girls, actually, I was thinking when you asked me what things I worked on that I'm proud of. I am very proud of Mean Girls. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, um, and I, it came from, there was an article in the, in the New York Times about this woman, Ross Wiseman, who, who was going around um, schools and doing these workshops and interventions with girls. And I took it to Lauren and said, oh, this, maybe this could be a movie and I could play the woman. And then as I, I wrote about 100 drafts of it, and then the, my part just kept getting smaller and smaller uh, wisely, I think, because the girls were the more interesting part. And so, yeah, so the, I was always meant to play that part, but... Um, in when I first started, I was a lot bigger on the, I was on the poster. <laughs> and then... That's how you can tell your part has my, really gotten too small. My imaginary poster. No longer on the poster. Yeah. Now, I'm looking at the time. I know you have to sign a lot of books. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll take, mm, 27 more questions. <laughs> and we'll take, let's take, I think three is okay. a good number. Three really good questions. And then, um, and then we'll let you go and you'll, you'll get on to the signing world, which is so much fun. And, um, no, it is fun. You get to meet the audience. Yeah, it's nice. And, uh, you yeah, know, put a face to, uh, to the sound of laughter. 
So, very is eloquent. The stage center. So there must be. Where are Cent we now? Center. Center. <laughs> right here. Hi. Um, Hi. This question is for Tina. Oh, there is an echo. Um, I was wondering, in the early on in the book, you talk about how you found your voice um, through improv, your performing voice, and then you also say how it changed your worldview, mm -hmm. improv. And I was wondering, in what way, how? Well, um, you know, people who really get into improv, it, it can be, it's sort of like a, a cult to them. They, it's all they talk about, it's all they do all the time. And, and you've, in the book, I talk about those kind of basic rules of improv being, you know, saying yes and, and being in the, in the Explain moment. Explain what you mean by that. Well, saying, saying yes means, you know, it's, if we're improvising and I say, freeze, I have a gun, and you say, that's not a gun. Yeah. That, that's a bear. That's saying no. That's, saying, that's to denying, and that kind of ruins the scene. Um, and so you're trained to, to kind of respect what the other person has started. And you, if I say freeze, that's a, this is a gun, then you say whatever you want to say. Oh, <laughs> I oh so I, I'm supposed yeah. to improv back. If you want. Just, just give me a minute. <laughs> People with a stand-up background approach it differently. <laughs> Just go, you answer, continue answer, you see. answer the question. Um, so that's agreement. Um, and so, and, and, uh, and kind of trying to stay in the present is a big thing about Im improv and not dwelling in the past or the future. It's a lot of the same. Uh, that's not a gun. No, so it's still. It was good. Okay. Um, and so I think it gave me a kind of a, a, a more positive worldview and a, 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 with approaching problems and just always feeling like, you know, there's always, there's always a yes to be had, there's always a solution to be had, that kind of thing. Someone's walkie-talkie went off. Hello. One down. One down. <clears throat> uh, These next two are going to be great. They're to your left. Hi. Hi, uh, so both of you are such natural, talented writers, and I was wondering what advice you could give for other people who are trying to become writers and who are writing, yet not professionally. And, comedy uh, writing, specifically? Comedy writing, yeah. yes, not drama. I know what I usually tell people, which is, is if, you, if you're doing any kind of comedy writing, that you have to get it in front of some kind of an audience. Uh, even if it's if it's meant to be performed, even if you get people to do it, you know, at the back of a bar, whatever, you just that there's you there's no other way to test it, except getting in front of an audience. That's good. What do you I'm, say? Yeah, I think a lot of people want to get it to submit it to a show, but I, th that's a really good good advice. If somebody if somebody wants to be a performer or a comedian, I say get on stage every chance you get, every chance you get, make work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's two, and we'll make this our last uh, question because we'll have been on for a while. And uh, we, but I'd like to say we have enjoyed. I think we, at least yes. we have enjoyed doing this, and um, I think. Uh, thank you for doing this, Steve. I want to thank Steve for agreeing to do this. Oh, it's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure to do this. And. Uh, the book is wonderful, it's well written, it has a feeling of spontaneity, which I really like. And I, I read that you, <laughs> I mean, in the, it's in the book, it's, it's funny, I don't know if it's true or not, you wrote it mostly while you were standing up in your laundry room, you Yeah, said. I did a lot of it, <laughs> hiding from my child. Yes. <laughs> so we'll take another question from the audience and we'll leave it at that. So make it a good one if you... Hi there, I'm in the rafters above you. Rafters? Of okay, middle, Oh, yes, sorry. I see you, yes. <laughs> yes. Steve, I love your banjo pick and love you with the Steep Canyon Rangers. You're awesome. Couldn't hear that. I couldn't hear it either. I yeah, love you with the Steep Canyon Rangers. I'm a big bluegrass fan. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. And then the question for Tina is, I grew up watching the Carol Burnett show and the Dick Van Dyke show, and I always thought, I want to look like Laura Petrie, but I want Rob Petrie's job. <laughs> so is there a sitcom character that you always fantasized becoming one day? Uh, 
Yes, um, the uh, Vicky from the Love Boat. <laughs> <laughs> I used to put on my fanciest nightgown, which is a ra little rayon number, and drink. Um, this is such a coincidence, first of all. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I would mix orange soda and cream soda in a champagne glass and watch The Love Boat. Wow. And I've never quite got there. Well, with that, uh, <laughs> now I just can't wait to get backstage with my little outfit that I prepared. And we will say thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Tina Fey. Thank you. Thank you very much.